Yeah, so I'm Jen Goldbeck. I'm from the University of Maryland. I'm director of the Human Computer Interaction Lab there. Uh, I'm also in the Cybersecurity Center and actually did my PhD there with Jim, who now follows me around instead of me following him around, apparently. Um, and, and I'd like to start with a slide that Jim will write, because this was in my dissertation defense in 2005. And I had started, uh, so I started my PhD in 2001, and, and I remember meeting with Jim and saying, I've got kind of these vague interests in how things interact, and he said, great, do whatever you want. Um, and I, I kind of messed around for a while and ended up studying social networks on the web, which were kind of not a thing in 2001, and started to become a thing over the course of while I was working on my dissertation. Um, and I defended in 2005, and I was still like giving talks to computer scientists, and they'd say, well, this isn't really computer science, right? This is social science. And I said, you wait. like You're going to want to talk to me in a couple of years. And now they're all like my best friends, and we're on grants together. So I've, you know, I'm a little smug that I won that one. Um, but I started off with this, with this question, and this is what my dissertation research was on, on how do we infer trust between two people? So this is social trust. If you have two strangers on the web, how, much, how can you guess how much one person might trust another if they don't know each other? And so here we have a like, really simple social network where person A knows person B and has some trust for him, and B knows C, and B has some trust in C. So can we guess how much A might trust C? That was the, the core question of my dissertation. And we came up with these rhythms. This slide was in there, too. It was very fancy, and got some formulas, and you get some results at the end, and like that was great. Um, and then I defended, and I said, like, what am I going to do now? Uh, because we had built all algorithms on the assumption that, like, of course, when people are maintaining their social media profiles, they're going to go in and rate how much they trust people. Like, of course. And, and you were doing this kind of thing back in, like, 2003, 2004. It was awesome to, like, say all this stuff about your relationships and categorize your friends. And we don't do any of that anymore. And, in fact, as soon as I finish this work, it became clear we were going in a direction where people weren't going to be adding that kind of quantitative information. So a handful of us had been doing this kind of research where we had weighted graphs and we built algorithms. And it turns out that the core data we needed for those algorithms to work was not something that was going to come onto the web in big scale. So then the question was, you know, then what? Then what do we do? And so I started kind of pushing around in a bunch of areas, and I thought, one thing that might really be interesting, if we're talking about trust, which is sort of a psychological, sociological concept, is to look at ways that people are similar. And we had done some quantitative analysis. We, I built a social network as part of my dissertation project where people were rating movies, and we were looking at all kinds of ways of looking at their overlaps and kind of doing recommender systems, but also to estimate trust. So there's some underlying research, both in computer science and in social science that said, if you can understand the ways in which people are similar to one another and when they're different, that can help you understand how much they might trust each other. And so after a couple of years, I settled in and said, well, why don't we start with personality? Personality traits, like, so you've all probably done like a Myers-Briggs personality test, like the INTJ, right? Um, so there's two widely accepted personality tests. Myers-Briggs is one. And then there's one called the Big Five, which is basically the same. Uh, Myers-Briggs is copyrighted and the Big Five is free, so we use the Big Five in our research. Um, and I said, well, maybe if we can understand people's personality traits, then we can, you know, first we got to figure out what their personality traits are, and then we can sit down and see if there are patterns in how matches or, or differences in personality relate to trust. Uh, so, you know, I'm actually a big introvert. I love talking to people. But, like, if I go to a party, like, I need to go home and, like, sleep, right? Uh, so that's the sign of an introvert. Extroverts, they leave the party, and then they want to go do a bunch of other stuff because they're so energized. Um, so maybe it's the case that I'm an introvert, and maybe I'm better paired with an extrovert. I will trust extroverts more because they're going to keep me from having to like suffer and make small talk on my own at a party, right? Because they're going to do all of the talking for me. Or maybe I'm just like so overwhelmed by them that I actually don't trust them that much. This was the core question. The problem, well, 
I don't know if it's a problem. The thing that often happens in research that happened here is that this problem of figuring out people's personality traits became so interesting that we never have gotten to the trust part of this, really. Um, so now we leave behind the, those six years of work um, and come into this space of how do we infer attributes about individual users based on their social network profiles? That's the core question. So we started off with personality traits. Um, and we're not the only people to do this, though we were the first. Um, people are doing it better than us now with big data sets. Um, but I think we've got some really actually cool insights that come from this work that we published. So there's five personality traits that we looked at, hence the big five. Um, extroversion and introversion we just talked about. Conscientiousness is sort of how much of a planner you are. So if you're like a list maker, you would have a high conscientiousness score. Uh, if you're a procrastinator who kind of just puts stuff off, uh, you'd have a low conscientiousness score. Agreeableness is sort of how we use that term in everyday language. Openness is openness to new experiences. So if someone says, hey, let's go you know, check out this new restaurant and see how it is, if you're just like, oh, I'd really like to go to the place that we always go, you'll have a low openness score. Um, and then neuroticism is everybody's favorite. And that's uh, basically emotional stability. So if you're quick to anger, if you're super anxious, you'll have a high neuroticism score. Kind of mellow, more stable people would have a low neuroticism score. Uh, the way you do this is that there's a, there's a bunch of tests that will do this, but there's a pretty good 44 question one. Um, and it starts off, I see myself as someone who, dot, 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 and then there's a list of 44 ways to complete that sentence. Um, so I see myself as someone who is interested in meeting new people. And then you rate that on a scale of one to five from strongly disagree to strongly agree. And basically, each question is assigned to a personality trait. You average the scores, and then you get a score for yourself for each of those traits. So what we did is we tried on both Facebook and Twitter to predict people's actual scores. So we didn't classify them as you know, introverted or extroverted. We wanted to actually predict the specific score on these tests uh, by analyzing people's, you know, everything that they had posted. Um, and we did that in a few kind of interesting ways, and, and we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, so we had everybody actually take this 44 question version of the personality test, and then we collected a bunch of data from their profiles. Here's what we looked at from Facebook. Um, we had about 300 people in our, uh, in our studies, which is like great for social science research and like ridiculous for big data research, right? You go know, like 300 doesn't count. Um, and in fact, there's a lot of stuff we could not do because we only had 300 people. So. For some of these categories, for example, activities and preferences, we, used, we built a Facebook app to administer um, this personality test, and then we'd grab all the public data from people's profiles. So activities and preferences would be like favorite books, favorite bands, favorite movies. We didn't have enough density in our data that we could say, oh, you know, if a person likes this movie, it's, it says something about this trait, because it's likely that we have one or two people in the whole data set who like it. So the, the data just wasn't dense enough to do that. Instead, what we did here was look at uh, quantified versions of all this. So we counted the number of characters in each of those fields. How long was your list of favorite books? How long was your list of favorite movies? We didn't care what the movies were. We didn't care if they had like super long titles. We just you know, super quantified everything to see if it would work. Um, so that's activities and preferences. Personal info, again, was super quantified. So we looked at, did you list a religion or not? Um, were you married or not married? As if you've looked at Facebook relationship statuses, there's this huge list of them. Um, so we just said married or anything else, or if you didn't list it. Um, gender, we were able to break into male and female. They only had two at the time. Now they also have a big, long list of options, but they only had two then. Uh, so really kind of binary values or counts to see how much information a person shared. Um, we've got a few kind of statistical things. Structural attributes here um, are two social network structure features. How many friends do you have and how dense is your egocentric network? So basically how many of your friends are friends with each other? And then we tried with just that, so you can ignore the big red arrow, and it didn't work. Um, so if we just looked at this information that we had, we didn't get any meaningful results. 
So he kind of threw in this language feature, which is a big arrow, but there's actually a really small amount of text that people have written on Facebook. Um, with an app, you're able to grab, at, at least at the time we did this, the latest status update and a couple little parts of the profile, one called a blurb and one called about me. Um, I don't even know if those are there anymore, but these were you know, one or two sentence things that people would post. Uh, we started off with about 600 users and we set a threshold that said there needs to be at least 10 words for us to do automated text analysis on and that dropped out half of our subjects. Um, so we really are talking about you know, one or two sentences is what we analyzed. But we took that and we said we'll see what we can do with it. We fed it into a tool called Luke. How many of you have used it? L-I-W-C? Oh my god. It's, this is like the best tool you can get. Um, so it's L-I-W-C. Linguistic Inquiry and Word Count, I believe is the, if you do LIWC, you'll find it. Um, it's not free, but it's like 30 bucks, so it's basically free. Um, you, it's a psycholinguistic text analysis tool. You feed in a document, so you know we were doing 20 word things here, but you can feed in a whole essay. And it spits out a report with 81 categories um, of psycholinguistic uh, psycholinguistic categories and what percentage of words fell into those categories. So it has things like um, happy words or sad words, anger words, uh, biological processes. So if you're talking about sleeping or sneezing or running, um, things that you're doing. Uh, there's consumption words. So if you're talking about eating or drinking. So they have all these different categories. You'll see some of them listed in some, some later slides here. And, uh, and so we said, Maybe those will be meaningful, even though we only have a handful of words to work with. Um, it turns out it was actually quite useful for us to get good results. We basically did the same on Twitter. I'm going to lump all these together. Um, these are, again, those same features from Luke. We used a couple other text analysis tools here. MRC is another psycholinguistic text analysis tool. Um, it's free but more limited. It quantifies things like... Um, the imageability of words. So a, a carrot has high imageability. You can picture it in your head really clearly. Um, happiness has low imageability, right? It's easier to, to make a picture of a carrot than a picture of happiness. Um, and again, if, not a lot of profile information on Twitter, so we relied much more heavily on text analysis, um, those same structural features, and we did a little sentiment analysis too. But the, the overall idea was the same. Get a big feature set throw it into a machine learning algorithm and see what kind of results we get. But we started off wanting to do some correlational analysis. Uh, maybe it's the case that some feature that we pull out tightly course correlates with um, a personality trait. This is the ugliest slide I have in any deck of slides. Um, I usually give prettier ones, but it's pretty good. Uh, there's interesting stuff here. So we have a list of features in this column. You can see the personality traits are listed across the top here. And I've bolded the statistically significant results. And you'll see that some of them make sense. Um, so for example, we have a category called anxiety words. Where are they? There we go. Anxiety words right here. And that positively correlates with neuroticism. Well, neuroticism is a personality trait that measures anxiety. So it makes sense that people who have higher neuroticism also use more Anxiety words. Jim, you have the same ringtone as me. <laughs> oh, good choice. Um, so here we have structural features. Um, number of friends is positively correlated with extroversion, so extroverts tend to have more friends. But neg density is negatively correlated, which means extroverts tend to have friends that aren't friends with each other, which makes sense. If you're an extrovert, you're making friends in lots of different social circles who are less likely to know one another. And so those, those correlations make sense. Some of them we just kind of wonder about. Um, so ingestion words are positively correlated with agreeableness. Like, why is it that agreeable people talk about eating more? I don't know. Um, but my favorite one, and I have a, a lesson to go along with this last one, um, is this last one. The last name length in characters, how many characters are in your last name, is positively correlated with neuroticism. The longer your last name, the more neurotic you are. 
so a few things here. One, the fact that I have this feature indicates how desperately we were trying to find some results in this data, because it was not working for a long time. Um, and so I was like, let's count everything. And so we counted the last name length and characters. Um, and it's a pretty funny result. And uh, and when I talk about this, it's interesting. Like The less scientific the audience, the more theories people really desperately want to share with me about why that's true. Um, and my pet theory is that if you have a long last name, you go through like a lifetime of it being misspelled, and it just eventually makes you an angry person. Um, so in, when this research came out, uh, it, we got quite a lot of media attention for it. Um, we were on the cover of the Washington Post, and you know, hundreds of newspapers covered this. And uh, and the local like NBC affiliate in Washington D.C. said they wanted to come and do a story about it. So they came into the lab and you know we did some face to face stuff and I actually showed them this slide and you know I figured they're never going to show this on the news and I did, said basically the same thing I just did with you here right like that it makes sense that this correlates here's kind of why this is and by the way look at this hilarious little thing at the bottom where your last name is correlated with neuroticism now scientifically there's a lot of correlations that I've computed here. Right? These are all Pearson correlations. And this isn't all of them. I mean, there's 120. Most of them are not statistically significant. So 120 features correlated with each of the five personality scores. You're going to get some statistical errors in there, right? Stuff will show up as statistically significant that isn't. And I believe that's what this is. It is not actually statistically significant, but there's so many. We didn't do any correction for that. We just did so many correlations that because we actually weren't, none of these correlations are strong enough that they're actually predictive, right? If you look at all of them, they're, you know, 0.2. I think the biggest one we got was maybe 0.35. And we weren't interested in, is there a correlation between these things? We were interested in doing the prediction. So this is just kind of a stopping point to say, let's see what the data looks like. So we could say, no, no personality trait can actually be predicted by any one of these things. So if we had had like super, if we had had a really strong correlation, like a 0.7 or a 0.8, or if our goal was to find these correlations, then I absolutely would have done the corrections. But we kind of did this and threw it out. Like these correlations were never used. We'll take that out in the okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, so I have NBC in my office and showed them this and said, this is just a statistical blip, but like here's my hilarious personal theory funny joke. And so here's the story that ran on NBC. <laughs> Science proves that people with long last names are more neurotic. And then they, and they've got me like saying my pet theory with this like stupid grin on my face because I was like joking. And then they went to like the CVS, like that's our local drugstore parking lot, like down the street from campus. And there they've got the reporter, and she's like, "What's your last name?" And the guy's like, "My last name is Wu." And she says, "Well, science says that you must not be very neurotic." And he says, "I think science is great." Right? Like, <laughs> So I, it was like my strong lesson on not to make jokes about science with the media, uh, especially when it's like a really fun and easy story to report. Um, so any, anyway, last name, length, and characters. I don't think it means anything. But if you have a pet theory, um, I'd love to add it to my list of pet theories that have been shared. I, I personally like the angry over a lifetime one. Here's the actual result. So we threw it. We didn't use those correlations for anything. Um, it was kind of an interesting glimpse at the data. And instead, what we did was take all of those features that we had and fed them into a machine learning algorithm, a few of them, to do regression analysis. Um, so I used Weka for this, so I didn't actually have to program any of these. Um, have any of you used Weka? It's a beautiful, wonderful machine learning tool. Um, it's a little old school Java-y in the interface. It's like kind of clunky and ugly looking. Um, but it has beautiful implementations of every major machine learning algorithm and lots of control over the parameters. It's a great tool. So if you ever want to like try some machine learning, it'll take you a day to figure it out if you're not an artificial intelligence person. And then you're like off and running and doing analysis. So uh, these are our results from Facebook. So we have our personality traits here. These are our error rates, and we use two machine learning algorithms, M5 rules and Gaussian process. Um, and our error rates are pretty good. We're getting like 11 or 12 percent error, which means you know if you the uh, the personality traits are scored on a one to five scale. So if you took the test and you got a four, we would maybe guess you had a 4.5. 
Um, depending on the mood you're in when you take the personality test from month to month, your values can actually vary that much. Um, so we were able to do quite a good job guessing here on Facebook. Twitter had some more mixed results. Um, for neuroticism, we did really well. And I think that's because neuroticism probably comes out quite clearly in text in your writing. Um, and for Twitter, we had a huge amount of text. We could take everybody's tweets and analyze them. Um, but for things like agreeableness and extroversion, we did not, this is not better than random, what we were, the accuracy we were able to get here. Um, so kind of mixed results. Fortunately, people are doing a good job with this kind of thing now. Um, this is my favorite slide, but unfortunately, it's not my research. So I like to think I inspired some of this research. Um, so this is a great paper from the Proceedings of the National Academies that was published about a year and a half ago by researchers at Cambridge. Um, and they looked at whether or not you could look at Facebook likes and predict a whole bunch of different things. Um, and so if you Google like PNAS and Facebook likes, you'll find this paper. It's four pages, really easy to understand, just a beautiful little piece of work. Um, so we used all this different data from Facebook. And they were looking at just your likes, just the things that you've liked. And that's interesting in a few ways. One, likes are public. Um, so you can protect a lot of stuff on your Facebook profile, but if you like the page for, I don't know, the Baltimore Ravens. We have a lot of people at my school who like that. Um, it's public. People can go and, and find that data. So it's interesting because this is data you can't protect. And also, it's so narrow. Um, so they were able to do this analysis. They had 65,000 people participate in their study, which is lovely from a social science perspective. That's a huge amount of data. And they set about trying to predict a whole bunch of different attributes. So the chart that you see here um, is a list of some of those. So you, whether you're single or in a relationship, um, I love this second from the top, whether your parents were together when you were 21. So did your parents get divorced before you were 21? Um, gender, religion, political preference. When I'm outside the US, nobody kind of understands political preference. Um, I say, you know, we and I'll show you, I've got slides on our work on this next. If you're a liberal or conservative, and the Americans all say yes, and everybody else goes, what does that mean? Like, how can you just put people in one group or another? But you can only be in two groups in the US, and so um, we predict which, they predict which one you're in. Um, the, the values that you're seeing here, areas are areas under the curve. So anything bigger than 0.5 is better than random guessing. Um, and that's useful for things like um, Christianity versus Islam. 90% uh, of the people in that group were Christian. So it's really easy to guess well, right? You just guess everybody's Christian and you're right 90% of the time. Um, so doing the area under the curve makes it, if you pick one person out of each group, how likely are you to properly classify both those people? Um, so they did better than random guessing for all of these. Now some are better than others. Whether your parents were together at 21, they have a 0.6, which is still kind of mind boggling for me that somehow your likes, it comes out that your parents got divorced before you were 21. Um, but things like gender and, uh, and race were highly predictable by likes. So that's pretty exciting by itself. Um, and then they also did some things that aren't shown in this chart. They did personality prediction and were able to do quite well. They also had people take a standard intelligence test. So I don't know if, if you guys have taken like a standard IQ test where you have like, you know, four different patterns and which one of these, you know, which you have three that are shown and you have to pick the fourth from a list. Um, I hadn't taken one of those since like elementary school and I redid it when I was reviewing this research. So they had a bunch of people in their study here take a personality test and then using their likes tried to predict their intelligence. Um, they could do quite well on predicting somebody's intelligence. And in the paper, they reported the top five likes that were predictive of high and low intelligence. OK, so the top five, I always only remember four. Uh, likes for high intelligence are science. So that makes sense. Smart people like science. Um, thunderstorms, kind of science-y, right? So OK. Uh, the Colbert Report. So uh, the Colbert Report actually covered this study when it was published, since they were a predictor of high intelligence. And, uh, and I always forget the fourth one. And then curly fries. Was it liking the Facebook page for curly fries? So I kind of put that logo on there. It wasn't on there on Facebook, but I put that there. The top predictor for low intelligence, and this is where I disclaim that this was not my research, uh, was liking the page I love being a mom is the top 
predictor for low intelligence on Facebook. Okay. Yeah, it's easy to upset the moms in the room with that, but I not my work. Um, okay, so why is liking curly fries highly predictive of high intelligence? Um, because curly fries are super tasty, right? Um, but people of all intelligence levels probably think that. So here, they don't offer an explanation for it in the paper, but here's my kind of um, computer science, social science explanation of that. We have this concept in sociology called homophily which means you are friends with people who are like you. Um, the, it's the birds of a feather principle. And this has been shown in hundreds and hundreds of studies to be true. So if I'm uh, a young person, I tend to be friends with young people. If I'm rich, I tend to be friends with rich people. And this isn't all my friends are like this, but rather that I have more friends than like me than would be expected if I were randomly picking from the general public. If I'm white, I tend to be friends with more white people. If I'm uh, Jewish, I tend to be friends with more Jewish people, and so on it goes. If I'm smart, I tend to be friends with smart people, proven in a lot of research. So my guess is what happened here is that the person who started the Curly Fries page, or maybe one of the early people to like it, happened to be a person who would score high on this intelligence test. And at the time, if you liked a page, it would show up in your Facebook profile, like, D Jen just liked Curly Fries. And your friends would go, oh man, I totally like Curly Fries too. And then they would like that page. Um, so if a smart person likes it, their friends all see that they liked curly fries, and some of their friends are going to be like, yeah, me too, and like it. And their friends are going to also be smart by homophily, right? We, they're going to have a, a smarter group of friends. And then those, their friends will see that they liked it, and they're also going to tend to have smarter friends because of homophily. And so you get this spreading through a network in ways that we understand, but spreading through a subset of the network that happens to be more intelligent because of this homophily principle at play. And the same is probably true of the I love being a mom page. It probably happens that one of the early likers of this page, or the more influential ones, happened to be someone who would score low on this test. Their friends saw it and liked it, and their friends also, by homophily, would score low, and it spreads that way. Yeah. Yeah, uh, no, the answer is no, and it would be a great research project. So now you have something to do for the fall semester. Um, I, would, I would love to see that research done, because it's, it's really straightforward. It would be pretty straightforward to do, especially if you can get the data. Um, and it would be a beautiful way to integrate a whole bunch of pieces of this work, to really pull in the kind of social science component. Here's what homophily is, um, along with the kind of network spreading stuff. Um, and I think you could find it in a bunch of ways, but I haven't seen any research doing it. So good idea. <laughs> um, so there you go. This is, I think this is a great study because it takes kind of this nugget of an idea. Let's build some features that represent people, come up with a set of traits, do some machine learning to see if we can predict those traits. Um, we did it on a small scale and it worked okay. And they did it on a very big scale with some easy publicly accessible data and it worked brilliantly in a lot of ways. And I also like this study exactly because of this last example. Even though they don't give this explanation of why something like curly fries, which is totally irrelevant to intelligence, is predictive. They don't give that explanation. But if you integrate all that research together, you can find that explanation. And I love that it shows how, at the end, liking the page for curly fries is not reflective of intelligence, but it's rather reflects back on you the traits of other people who have taken that action. Right? So you like the curly fries page, and science says, smart people do that thing. And they don't know what the thing is, but it happens to be liking curly fries. And since you do a thing that smart people do, we're going to guess that you're a smart person, too. It's so pretty cool. And that's what my TED talk is about. So uh, it's called the Curly Fry Conundrum. And if you Google curly fries, and you'll find it. And it's five minutes of lower scientific discussion than that. Um, so let me lift let you to another thing. Um, so we also did a study, which I had alluded to before, on predicting political preference. Um, and again, in the US, you just end up on a liberal to conservative spectrum um, because we don't allow nuance in political preference. And um, we did this in a very different way. So I present this not because it's a different kind of result. It's the same thing. We're predicting an individual's political preference. But we do it in what I like to think of as the 
either most naive or unintelligent depending way, but it's super effective. And so I think that this is a great perspective on other ways this works. We originally started this study wanting to predict media bias, which you learn very quickly is a terrible, terrible kind of research to do because uh, anyone who's done a study on media bias, one, has been viciously attacked for whatever their results are, and two, they tend to be super biased in bad scientists anyway. Um, there's, I was shocked at some of the research that I read on media bias that it had ever been allowed to be published because it's just so tainted and terrible. So we kind of backed off that and said, well, instead of looking at media bias, let's look at the audience of media outlets. So not is Fox News uh, biased towards conservatives, but do they happen to have a really conservative audience? And we stay out of the bias part. So we said, we're going to do this on Twitter. Um, so first we need to know if people are liberal or conservative or in the middle. And then we'll look at the audience of these uh, media outlets on Twitter and see. So here's our genius idea. And you, I'll see if you can preempt what we're going to do. Here's our little seed. So we started off, we had done some previous research on uh, members of the US Congress using Twitter. So we said, all right, well, we know about, all about them. So we got all the members of the US Congress who use Twitter. These are our people at the top here. And then there's a bunch of uh, ways that you can get a liberal to conservative rating of them. Um, there's a couple organizations that actually analyze their voting records and put out scores. Um, one of them is Americans for Democratic Action, which kind of like they get meh, sometimes criticized, sometimes not. Uh, but there's also a political science group based in a university that puts out something called DW scores, which are the similar kinds of ratings. Um, we used both and got identical results. So. Um, I think these are computed with the ADA scores, but it worked at uh, no statistically significant difference between using the two. So for each member of Congress, we knew how liberal or conservative they were based on their votes. So we went onto Twitter and we got everybody who followed at least one member of the US Congress. So we had millions of people in this data set. And then, well, you tell me, what are we gonna do? So we know, like, I followed these three members of Congress. Um, how do we come up with a score for me on how liberal or conservative I am? It's interesting to see what the audiences say about this. Don't be too clever. Yeah, average, right? Just average it. But it's interesting when I talk to like journalists, I've given this talk a lot to journalists, they've got all these very complex ways they want me to average things. We just averaged it. We just took a simple average of the scores of the people they followed. Now that's not necessarily gonna work, right? Because I might follow just one person and then the average is that person's score. Um, I might live in a state that doesn't reflect my views but follow my representatives, right? So um, if I, I live in Maryland, which is a very liberal state, but if I lived in Virginia, like three miles south, um, as a pretty conservative state and I followed my representatives, I would look super conservative because they all would be Republicans even if I didn't vote for them. So there's no reason this is necessarily gonna work, but we've said, well, we'll go with it anyway. So that's what we did. We averaged for each person, and we did that for everybody, so we got a score for all of these people in the data set. I will come back to whether or not that was right or wrong, and I'm going to show you the media bias results first. Um, we had this list of media outlets that we wanted to work with, so we looked at them on Twitter, and we just found everyone who followed these outlets who was in our sample up here. And we had a really big sample, so that worked. And then how do we come up with a score for Fox News? Just average, right? Average those people who are averages of their uh, representatives, and we get a score for them, and we did that for everyone. Uh, how many of you are from the US? Okay, so you'll, you'll, you'll be able to tell the rest of the group if this is right or not. Uh, this is a plot, conservative is red, liberal is blue, of the scores of our media outlets. So um, down here on the conservative end, we get Fox News and the Drudge Report and the Washington Times. In the middle, we get places like US News and World Report, CNN. Our most liberal audience is Morning Edition from National Public Radio. Um, not nearly as liberal an audience as Fox News and the Drudge Report have conservative audiences. They're farther down on the spectrum. Americans, does this sound right? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's right on. And there, there is one pretty decent study of media bias that like was not funded by uh, Republicans or Democrats that, and this almost exactly matches the results they got. So that was 
pretty encouraging. And, and at first we just published this and we said, so it kind of makes it seem like that step we're doing in the middle is right. Because the stuff that comes out from using that is right. And you know they let us get away with that, but we weren't really satisfied with it. So we came back in the 2012 presidential elections. We did this again. We didn't bother with this bottom step, but we got all the members of Congress. We got their scores. We got everybody who followed them. We computed their scores doing this averaging method. And then on the day of the election, we grabbed the tweets from all of those millions of people and basically went through them by hand with a little bit of help to see if they said who they voted for. Um, yeah, I saw some eyebrows raised. We did read a ton of tweets. Um, it was a little painful. But we, we were able to get thousands of people on each side who said they voted for uh, one person or another. A lot of it could be done a first pass automatically. So there were tag, hashtags like vote Romney or vote Obama or Obama 2012. We still had to go through those because you know sometimes they were kind of mocking the other side. But everything that we used in this study was hand coded by two people, decisions matched. It was very solid data. A few thousand people on both sides. And we said, okay, let's guess who they voted for. If they were a, you know, above 50% liberal, we said they voted for Obama. If they were 50% or more Republican, we said they voted for Romney. Um, and we were right 98% of the time, which is like amazing ability to predict who people are voting for. Now, it's not perfect, right? Because these are people who said who they were voting for, so they may be the easier cases to guess. Um, but it's still, I think, really impressive that we can get results that are that accurate from a method that is like, stupid how easy it is, right? That we're just averaging things. And so this actually relies on, on some of those same premises that we were talking about before. It's kind of homophily, right? It's, it's homophily in sort of a targeted way. Um, I think you could do much, much more complicated things to make this better. But I think it's this great insight that you can look at, you know, here's this action that people are taking. You know, they're following this person. And that actually reflects back on them something about their preferences. And you can do kind of simple stuff, no machine learning, nothing in here, and still get pretty decent results. OK, so now to like the privacy side of this. So I love doing this research. And we've got all kinds of stuff still going on in this space now. Um, and since my TED talk went up, I gave the talk in October, but it went up, I think, in January on the TED website. And I get emails like, five or six emails a week from people who like want me to help them start a business predicting certain attributes about people. And I said in that talk, like if I ever get bored being a professor, I'm going to start a company where I like contract out to HR firms and you give me the names of people you want to hire and I predict all these attributes about them and sell you the report. Right? Uh, I would make a ton of money doing that. And people email me and they're like, that's a great idea. Like I would love to do that with you. And I say that, no. Like it's creepy unethical and somebody's going to do it pretty soon but I'm not going to be the one to do it. And uh, we're doing work now on um, partnered with a group on campus that does um, drug use prediction like they actually go into prisons and things and test people like do urine tests see you know which drugs are emerging where um, we're partnering with them to actually do a project predicting that through social media um, doing some security stuff in this space so I'm continuing on the, with this work and I think it's fascinating but there's this super scary side to it too right which is if I was selling those reports to HR companies I mean one these things aren't right all the time like a lot of times they're not right even close to all the time you know 75 percent of the time like that's a great result for us, but that like you you can't make a decision based on something that's wrong a quarter of the time, right? Especially when you're making big decisions. But we're already seeing lots of examples of this stuff creeping in. This is actually an older article, which happens to be from CBC News in Montreal, um, about a woman who worked at IBM, I think in Montreal, uh, definitely in Canada, and she had been kind of put on permanent disability because of severe depression. So her company said, yes, she's severely depressed. She should go on disability. Her doctor said it. She was on disability. Um, and they took her benefits away because she posted this picture of herself on Facebook. And the insurance company said, she looks pretty happy to me. Like, she can't actually be depressed. And they took her benefits away. Um, and then they did a whole lot of backtrack and say, well, it wasn't just because of the picture. Like, we look at a lot of things. but. 
it seems like it kind of was just the picture, that she looked happy in the picture, and so they revoked her benefits. Um, I'm working on a book now, Social Media Investigation, um, which is for law enforcement and lawyers and journalists to find information about people, N none of this predictive stuff, just how to look up information about people online. And I include a bunch of anecdotes about criminals who get caught through stuff they post online or people who get sued. And here we've got, I searched for pe fired in Facebook and there's 354 million results. Um, so this is happening a lot. I remember at one point, probably when I was a grad student, um, I was thinking like it'd be really interesting to track like how often social media is mentioned in news stories. And like now you can't do it, right? Because it's like all the time. Uh, and so, you know, these aren't all perfect matches, but there are just hundreds and hundreds of stories of people who are fired because of something that they've posted on social media. Sometimes deservedly so, and sometimes you just go, I can't believe that it's actually legal to fire someone for you know, having posted this perfectly legal and appropriate picture um, that their employers just didn't like. But I think this, this highlights the problem going forward of the science that we've been talking about here. You know, this is stuff that people have just posted, right? So you know, the 25-year-old teacher posts a picture of herself like having a beer at a party, and the high school she works at fires her because she's setting a bad example for students. Um, there's no inference there. There's no like crazy science there. Like That's just straightforward stuff. And people can kind of understand that. Um, they may, may disagree with it, but they say, OK, like I see that this is happening. But as part of all this research I've done, I, you know, I like to do media stuff. And I've done some of these you know, hour-long call-in shows on public radio. And I explain all the science in, I think, a pretty accessible way. And I still get people calling in saying, you know, if people don't like me because of the stuff I like on Facebook, that's their problem. Like, they don't need to be my friend anymore. Like, I'm going to be myself and my social media profile, and people just have to deal with it. And it's like, that's fine, but that's totally not what I'm talking about when we're talking about inferring your intelligence level because you liked the page for curly fries. Right? That's not something you can even understand, that what attributes are being reflected back on you because of the actions of millions of other people. Like You don't know if you like the curly fries page that it's going to indicate you're smart, or if you like the mom page, it's going to indicate that you're not very smart. Uh, the kinds of things that we can infer about people are really scary, and they're not the kind of things that people can protect themselves from. Uh, one of my favorite early examples in this space was an undergrad project at MIT in like 2009 called GADAR. And they were predicting sexual orientation. And they did this by looking at your friends. So they didn't look at anything you posted. They looked at your friends and what percentage of your friends had identified themselves as uh, gay or straight. And it didn't work too well for women, but for men, it was there's a very clear threshold. If more than like 2.58% of your male friends identified as gay, then you were too. And they were right this huge percentage of the time. And it was just like this simple threshold. If you wanted to conceal your sexual orientation, there's nothing that you could do to prevent that algorithm from finding it out. Because it doesn't look at what you posted. It looks at your friends and what information they're revealing about themselves. And homophily says we can find all kinds of things out that way. So I see that there's just this huge lack of understanding from the general public about what these algorithms can do. And then, I mean, we don't even understand the full implications of that that's going to have on people. You know, what if your insurance company starts using this to predict if you're a smoker, if you're a drug user, if you're a heavy drinker? That study from Cambridge has those attributes in it, and they can do it. Um, so what happens if your insurance rates are set based on what we predict about you? It seems unfair and scary, and people don't understand that. And then I have, this is my video. How many of you know what this is? Take this lollipop. Yes, I always love when I get to like introduce this. Um, all right, the website is takethislollipop.com. It's a video with sound, and you'll want to do it for yourself, but not right now, because all of a sudden, It'll, uh, it'll start talking. Um, so you get to see it do it for me. So, But write that down, takethislollipop.com. It's awesome, uh, and you're going to see it. This is an interactive horror film um, based on your Facebook profile. So you do connect with Facebook. And it's interesting, because when this came out, I was like, I'm not even going to bother, because I have 
the craziest privacy settings of anyone in the world on Facebook. Everything is protected and locked down and only like 15 people can actually see my posts and uh, there's no way it'll do anything. And then like two weeks later, I was like, all right, well, I should at least look at it. And it got like all this stuff that I never thought it would get. And then I said, I am like one of the world's experts on privacy and social media. And if I'm wrong, like every other person in the world also has to be wrong. Um, so this is both super entertaining and I think kind of enlightening. So let's let's take a look. Hopefully the video will work fine. I'll give you a little narration. So you have this connect with Facebook that you click at the bottom. And I'll just, this is my profile, so I'll point out a few things just as explanation as we go along. Alright, so that's my profile, my old profile picture. So if you see that backwards skater, that's me. Status updates from my friends, all the comments, all the list of my friends on the side. So that's me in the Red Sox playing hockey. My current location. At the time I got the video, of course. my profile taped to the dash right there, my picture. So there you go. And then it says Damon Hill is next. That's like, you know, pulls a random friend from your friend list on Facebook. It's awesome, right? It's like won a bunch of awards, like at South by Southwest and all these places. But it's interesting. It has this double role of really informing you about what data apps are able to get from your profile. I, I was shocked that it could pull all those status updates from my friends and comments. And, um, and I'm actually doing a research project now. Um, we used this to and compared it to how well it informed people about what data was shared with apps compared to the Facebook privacy policy. And this was more effective. Um, so we're, we're doing a, a lot of research around this idea of apps and privacy sharing and social media, because people really don't understand. Um, but I think that that's a good way, nice creepy way to close. Um, that there's this amazing science that we can do. And I think, you know, I, I say sometimes I feel like I'm in like a modern version of the Manhattan Project. That like I'm doing this amazing science that I think is worth doing. But the implications of it can be really frightening. And it, how many of you have read The Circle? Dave Egger's book. Oh my God, this is like required reading for everybody doing this kind of research. Um, it's this sort of satire of social media companies. Very quick, easy read. And um, it's one where I read it and I was like, that's kind of scary. And then like, I read it about a year ago and it's just gotten scarier the more I think about it. Um, because it, you know, it talks about what, you know, well, let's put cameras everywhere. Look, it can do a lot of good. And we can track down, you know, people who are fleeing the police. And then, oh, like, actually, we can track down everybody. Um, and, you know, what does privacy mean? Like, it's theft from other people if you don't share information about yourselves. And, like, that's like, oh, it's kind of, like, funny and satirical to have it in the book that they've got, you know, deleting is theft. And, like, all thoughts must be shared. But then you read these papers published by Facebook's data science group that say, um, you know, 
if people don't post something, like we want to know why, because they're depriving their friends and Facebook of the value of that post. And, and it's one of those things where like, I'm like, that was in that book, like where everything bad happened. Um, so get yourself a copy of The Circle. Um, but yeah, you know, I think it's this space where we want to do the science. And the science is really interesting, but the implications of the science are one that can e easily lead you down this sort of dystopian, terrifying path. Um, and you know, I think a lot of the way to deal with that is going to be policy oriented. Um, but there's also science that can help protect people from these things. And there's this whole middle space of how do you get people to understand what they need to protect themselves from. So um, I think that's it. This is a whole bunch of contact info for me. Thank you.